looks at prokaryotic cell structure and function. So here's some pictures showing you some morphological uh, diversity of the microbes. And so here's a microbe called Staphylococcus aureus, which causes a whole bunch of different um, infections. But this organism occurs in clumps, grape-like clumps, called um, Staphylococcus. This organism is a Streptococcus, Strep agalactiae, which um, can also cause infections, but this guy is a strep, and so we, we see the streptococcus type arrangement, which is like a string of pearls. Here's a bacterium called Bacillus megaterium, and this B. meg um, makes these rod-shaped cells, but they're in, they often occur in long chains. And then here's a, um, a bacterium that's, that, a, um, that is a spiral-shaped, and then here's our, another curve-shaped bacterium of Vibrio, and so again, I'll show you some of these things in greater detail, but some of the common shapes and arrangements. So these are the spherical microbes or coccus shaped microbes. So um, an individual cell is a coccus, an individual round cell is a coccus, and two of them together is a diplococcus. When you put them together as a string of pearls, that's a streptococcus. And so, but then if they're in packets like this, a packet of eight, um, that's a sarsini. But sometimes microbes are in tetrads, and so you can see these actual micrographs that go along with these. So here's a streptococcus, and here's a tetrad. And here's the staphylococcus arrangement that you can see here. So, you know, if you suspect the patient has a strep throat, for example, you can do a swab and, and look at the swab under the microscope to see if you see an abundance of streptococci, for example. If an individual has a wound, that's infected, you can swab it and look for staphylococcus, for example. Another common shape is the rod shape, but we also refer to it as bacillus. And so here's a single bacillus, and then two together is a diplobacillus, and then a chain of bacilli is streptobacillus. Some microbes have these little stalks, so there's unusual shaped. They're kind of rod shaped, but they have a little stalk on them. The stalk allows this particular microbe to attach itself to like rocks in a stream, for example, and then it'll produce a little baby that has a flagellum that can break away and swim off. <laughs> but um, the, these, those coccus and bacillus are the two primary uh, morphologies. Some unusual bacterial shapes are vibrios, which are a slightly curved rod, irregular shaped bacteria like these bifidobacteria. Bifidos have been used a lot lately in um, probiotic foods. So if you have a, you know, some kind of probiotics, you can look at the label and see if you've got any bifidobacteria in there. Some microbes are spiral shaped. These spirilla, for example, that are, um, <clears throat> that are uh, pretty rigid as opposed to spirochetes, which are very flexible, tightly coiled helix helical shaped cells. Some microbes are star shaped and then some have these pronounced rectangular shapes. So there's lots of unusual stuff going on in the microbial kingdom as far as mor morphology goes. And this is just a cutaway showing you some of the main features of the microbe. And then in the next slide are some um, you know, sentences to describe those particular features. So for example, microbes often have a capsule. And the capsule is often made of polysaccharide. And lots of microbes will use the capsule to prevent themselves from drying out if they happen to fall out of a moist environment. But they can also use it if they're infecting a host and, and, and it provides them some protection against um, being phagocytosed by immune system cells. So a lot of microbes will, um, a lot of bacteria rather, will have a cell wall which gives them rigidity and allows them to resist um, changes in um, and osmotic pressure in the environment so that they can, so they don't just fall apart. The plasma membrane, as you see here, is inside that, and the plasma membrane, membrane gives them selective uh, permeability. Inside, there's always abundance of ribosomes for protein synthesis. There's always a nucleoid. Again, the nucleoid, instead of a nucleus, we call it a nucleoid in bacteria because there's no membrane around the, the um, genetic material. So that's why they're prokaryotes. Many of these organisms have inclusion bodies, which allow them to concentrate nutrients, you know, basically just stockpiling nutrients when things are good, so that um, when they enter a starvation state, they can um, <clears throat> turn to these stores of nutrients. And of course, a lot of microbes have flagella, but not all. 
Fimbriae are used for attachment to different surfaces, and so that's they're, they're also very important. So again, you can cross-reference that picture with this, this table to get a sense so, of some of the things that microbes have. One thing I didn't mention in the previous picture are gas vacuoles. A lot of aquatic microbes, especially aquatic uh, photosynthetic microbes, might want to be buoyant rather than sinking to the dark <laughs> layers of the ocean. They would want to be buoyant so they can stay up in the light. So they may have gas vacuoles, for example. One thing I, I'll, I'll talk about later, endospores that, that some microbes produce to allow them to survive harsh environmental conditions. And again, I'll talk about that in more detail. But some of the functions of the plasma membrane, as I already alluded to, are um, separation of the cell's interior from the environment, which is important because you don't want to just let any old thing in. That's why you know, I have this second bullet point, a selective permeability barrier. Um, some molecules are allowed to pass in or out of the cell, which, you know, again, nutrients and wastes, for example, can come in and out. Some of the additional functions, it's the location of a lot of crucial metabolic processes, like the electron transport chain, is often located in the cell membrane, if the microbe has one, or has some version of an electron transport chain. Um, detection and response to chemicals usually occur through receptors that are embedded in the membrane. So microbes can use these receptors to process their environment to figure out whether it's beneficial or a hostile environment. And that often tells them whether they need to get the heck out of there or pursue the, that particular environment more closely. <laughs> and this is just a, a quick you know, overview of some of the things you might find. So an integral protein like this could be one of those sensors I just mentioned that's sticking out into the into the exterior of the cell and, and looking to process some kind of signal. So if my pointer here is a signal, the microbe can bind that and then process the signal and then relay that information to the inside of the cell to tell whether or not it's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, but anyway, again, it's usually a flexible um, um, cell, uh, lipid bilayer with a variety of decorations and, and, and uh, proteins embedded. One important point to make here is the difference between bacterial and archaeal membranes. And so the lipids that make up the bacterial membrane or the eukaryotic membrane um, consist of these ester linkages. So it's a glycerol ester linked to a, a long chain fatty acid or long chain fatty acids. So what I'm talking about is here, this little brown sphere and these little tails coming off. That's this right here. And so in archaea, it's actually an ether linkage. So there's a different chemistry between these things. And often the archaeal um, lipid, uh, lipids are branched. The side chains are branched. So that the, this combination of things gives the archaea the ability to um, have a generally a stronger membrane that gives them the ability to exist in more extreme environments. The ether bond is a little tougher than the ester bond. And then having these bran this branching allows the, 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 this membrane, these membrane lipids to stay together you know, better under adverse conditions. The cytoplasmic matrix has all those things I'd mentioned, like the nucleoid ribosomes for protein synthesis and inclusion bodies for storing nutrients. And again, the inclusion bodies, um, you know, again, they're, they, 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 can, can, they can be considered organelles. Um, they they have uh, typically have a membrane surrounding them that can vary in composition and and um, can contain proteins and lipids. But some different kinds of inclusion bodies include glycogen, same gly you know the same molecule that we store in our muscles um, as a nutrient source or as an energy source. The um, they're polymers of glucose, and so microbes again can store polymers of glucose as glycogen. Another carbon source that they can use is PHB, um, polyhydroxybutyrate. Another thing that microbes will store is um, amino acids, so nitrogen sources like arginine and aspartate as cyanophysine granules. And then another thing, and this is very unique to photosynthetic microbes, but a lot of photosynthetic microbes produce carboxysomes, which contain this key enzyme called rubisco. Rubisco is essential for carbon dioxide fixation, which is the which is the whole purpose of photosynthesis primarily. 
So another type of inclusion, as I mentioned, are the gas vacuoles that provide buoyancy, allowing um, photosynthetic bacteria like cyanobacteria to um, float and, and stay in the photic zone so they can photosynthesize. So, and then other versions of, of inclusions include these volatin granules or metachromatic granules. Typically, they have phosphates. Obviously, microbes really need phosphates for um, producing nucleotides like ATP, for example, um, or phospholipids for membranes. And then they also need sulfur granules. <clears throat> sulfur is essential for making cysteine and methionine. Magnetosomes are interesting too. There are certain bacteria which have they can concentrate magnetite and basically little magnets in their cell, their cyto, um, cytoplasm, and so that allows them to orient themselves in magnetic fields. So they can kind of know where north and south are, <laughs> so they can migrate along these magnetic lines. So here's a magnetosome here. And you can see the little magnet in this microbe. It's pretty neat stuff. And a lot of people are interested in studying these little magnets, you know, especially people that are interested in nanotechnology. So ribosomes are, again, the sites of protein synthesis, and they're made of proteins and, and um, ribosomal RNA. In prokaryotes, the ribosome is 70S, and that's a reference to its mass. In eukaryotes, the ribosome is 80S. So again, eukaryotic ribosomes are a little bigger. The um, nucleoid is irregularly shaped, obviously, and so it's just kind of a bunch of, bunch of double-stranded DNA thrown into the cytoplasm. But it's, it's not membrane-bound, as I'd mentioned. And there's typically one per cell, but there are bacteria that have two chromosomes. Um, so they're kind of diploid, like you and I are. And then the um, interesting thing about it, so here's a bacterium that's dividing by binary fission, so it's a rod-shaped bacterium. And this, this guy, you can see its, its genetic information has doubled. And here's a picture of a bacterial cell that's been lysed open, so you can see all its guts <laughs> spewed out into the medium. And this is a, these are the DNA fibers. But what this shows you is just how much DNA there is and should give you a sense for the fact that it's not just packed in there like a garbage bag just stuffed full of garbage. This thing has to have high levels of order and structure in order to function properly. How is this, you know, this little segment right here, for example, which might have a gene on it, how is that unwound and expressed and then repackaged? in seconds. You know, microbes are fast growers, so how do they do that? These are really cool questions that we, that we um, often have to ask each other.